This is the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. Detroit is the greatest! Straight up light you on fire for a Coney dog right now. Welcome in, everybody, to the first Motor City Sports Rant recording of the new year. I am the Doc, John Macaroon. Jason Jarvie will be calling in shortly. We got a lot to talk about. I'm sure everybody took in the playoffs over the weekend. The NFL, holy cow. Man, it was exciting. The divisional contests were really exciting. Some people will say that they feel bad for the Chicago Bears kicker, but I sit here and I go, <laughs> holy cow, man. We got to witness that firsthand where the Chicago Bears kicker was hitting uprights left and right and versus the Philadelphia Eagles. What a contest. Now, it wasn't as high scoring as many of us would have liked, but it was a close defensive battle and it was a very entertaining ball game. There's a lot to get to in the world of college athletics here in the state of Michigan. I think everybody can look to both Michigan and Michigan State's basketball teams and really pay attention because there's a chance to be very positive about both squads. They're playing a very good brand of basketball, and the two teams are going to collide. Unfortunately, they're not going to play until late February, early March. They're going to play two games, one game at the Breslin Center and one game at Chrysler. But holy cow, for the University of Michigan, they start the year off 15-0, and and they're only getting better, and it's a program that has been really impressive with John Beeline, and um, everybody that's paying attention to the Wolverines has been impressed. And then when you look over at what's going on with Michigan State, many people are discussing the fact that, hey, this could be a Tom Izzo team, meaning what does it mean to have a Tom Izzo team? Meaning that the talent is not exactly all there, but as a collective unit, then everybody is playing well in terms of playing their role the parts collectively are better than each individual part. And, uh, hey, when you got a good team and you play well, then you got a scenario in which you can compete. You can have a really competitive season and really a successful season. I'll talk to Jason about what his expectations are for both teams. And we'll do, obviously, the comparisons. And I'll definitely get Jason's opinion on what he thinks about the star quarterback that everyone's talking about for the Philadelphia Eagles. And here he is. Let's welcome him in. Jason Jarvey, Happy New Year, my friend. Welcome to the Motor City Sports Rant. I'm looking forward greatly to this talk. Happy New Year, John. It's good to be back. I'm glad you could squeeze me into your schedule. Hey, I'm glad that you're still willing to call me up. Uh, 2018, when everybody reflects back on it, probably one of the most cockeyed, crazy down year in Detroit sports, especially with the pro teams. But prior to you calling in, I was saying that, holy cow, when you peek into the Michigan Wolverines and the Michigan State Spartan basketball teams, there's a lot to be positive about. And watching them, I know you're getting the emails. There's a lot of good players. There's a lot of good talent. There's some stats being put up. There are some victories happening. And seeing Michigan State go on the road, a tough matchup versus a nationally ranked Ohio State team to get the victory. Michigan starting off 15-0. I want to start there. I'm impressed. I'm liking the hoops action, especially being a guy that's been covering college basketball lately. Yeah, you know, it's it's definitely, it's it's got to lift some people up. You know, I'm not following it terribly closely. And, I mean, you know how I feel about Michigan. But even I, even not watching the games, just having kind of an outside perspective, kind of seeing just the wins rack up and just keep on coming and coming, and it seems like they're getting production from, I mean, seemingly everywhere on their roster. So, I mean, Michigan fans have got to be happy. And I, I mean, I am impressed. I mean, and we've talked about it before. John Beeline is a great, he is a very, very good coach. He may be the better coach than Tom Izzo right now. And I mean, I'm not going to downplay what Michigan State's done uh, this year too. But I mean, 
you got to give it to Michigan right now at this point. And it's, it's really going to come down to what happens later in the season when you have the head-to-head matchups between Michigan and Michigan State, what they're going to do in the Big Ten tournament and in the NCAA tournament. Yeah, Jason, are you hearing the narrative in regards to what's going on in East Lansing? Many people are wondering, wow, maybe this is really a Tom Izzo team, meaning that when people say that, they are indicating that, you know what, last year there was an emphasis on Jaron Jackson and Miles Bridges and getting them the touches and getting them involved in the offense. But with this year, you got a collective unit that is playing and balling out. Now, there are some players that are playing really well, like Cassius Winston, Nick Ward. Those guys obviously have the talent. But are you kind of in agreement that, you know what, maybe this Michigan State team and maybe Tom Izzo, I know he wants to always keep up with the Joneses and be like Duke and be like Michigan and be like these other squads and get a lot of talent. But maybe for Tom Izzo, getting the one and dones is just not the best method for him. Maybe he should continue and maybe look back to what was successful for him and maybe just go out there, try to find system guys that might stay with you three to four years where if they grow like a Nick Ward who... If you recall, Jason, he kind of tested the waters, wanted to maybe go into the NBA, kind of went against it, took the advice of Tom Izzo and his family, came back, got better, improved the free throw shooting, improved his game, and is a guy now that's receiving some accolades, a guy that won Big Ten Player of the Week and is now a leader on this team. And maybe Tom Izzo just has to go back and find guys that are going to be tough that have talent, but also might be willing to stay three to four years and maybe in a couple seasons with an emerging Cassius Winston and continue growth with these classes, that's maybe the new way to go with Michigan State. You know, it kind of, I will say, it kind of seems like a seesaw because back when Michigan State really started this run in the mid-90s, that's how they that's how they built it, is that they, they had the guys that stayed the four years, and, you know, from the Flintstones, and all the way through the 2000s is that you had guys staying three, four years, getting better under a system. And then finally, when we're getting to the point where people are saying Thomas was an elite coach, Michigan State is an elite program that they need to be getting better guys when they started attracting some of those guys and then having to maybe cater to those guys a little bit more. That probably that, that affects what the, the whole team is going to do. So it would probably be helpful for Michigan state to really go back to this format of it's what John Beeline's doing. He finds the guys that fits his system that buy in and just work hard. And so it'll be interesting to see what Michigan state can do. You know, I don't think they have what it takes to really do what Duke and Kentucky and the Kansas is. I just don't think they have what it ha- have what it takes to go out and get all those just gigantic classes. They can't do the one and done. So Tom Izzo and really the college basketball is the the sport that you would want to do it where you can build these teams because it's not just a it's not like a college football playoff. It's not there's four games that that, that determine uh, the championship game. It's it's wide open. It's a sixty eight game tournament, sixty eight team tournament that Everybody has a shot, and I think if you go in there with a strong team, you're going to have a better chance at making it further on in the in the the Sweet Sixteens and Elite Eights and getting in the Final Fours. Yeah, Jason, I'm a, I'm in agreement with you because I think people were having this kind of conversation in regards to evaluating Mark D'Antonio and Jim Harbaugh because on Monday night everybody would have watched the College Football Finals. And people are trying to judge what's going on here locally in regards and comparing them to uh, Dabo Sweeney and uh, Nick Saban. And I think, seriously, we do kind of have to humble ourselves here in the Midwest and realize in basketball, in football, that Tom Izzo and John Beeline aren't going to be Duke. Zion Williamson likely will pass on Michigan and Michigan State if Duke makes a serious offer. If somebody from Alabama or Clemson or one of these elite teams makes a serious bid for a player, they're going to go there. And you just got to realize that you got to kind of play to your strengths 
and you can't sometimes keep up with the Joneses because if Michigan State tries to be like Duke, yeah, you can be in the mix for guys like a Jabari Parker, like a Zion Williamson. You know, you can be in the mix here and there for some of these guys, but I think the realistic approach is to play to your strengths, find guys that are going to be in your uh, wheelhouse that will compete, shoot the three, and and be a, be a dog and rebound and things like that. And for John Beeline, find players that are going to shoot threes and, and really try. But I sit here now kind of going, you know, I'm not as excited for Michigan because of the fact that when you look at Duke, I don't see anybody. If Zion Williamson comes to play and he's healthy, I don't think that Michigan or Michigan State are national title contenders. But at the same time, I think what we have to do is we have to also respect that, you know what, there may be a chance that they do play. Michigan could play Duke. State could play Duke. And the contest will happen. And I do think that we got to take a step back as fans and just be and just realize, you know what, let's evaluate these teams. Let's not constantly always just think about, you know, where these teams are in terms, uh, relatively speaking, of where they are competing for championships. And I think we can get more enjoyment out of it because I've kind of watched the last 10 games, five for Michigan, five for Michigan State, just watching the contest. And I've been relatively impressed. But if you start to compare and go, man, how does State compare to Duke or how does State compare to Michigan, it does get a little bit depressing. And and sometimes I do think that sports fans here in Michigan kind of have to be humble a little bit and realize that at this point in time that our teams are not nationally relevant at this point in time in terms of year in, year out success. A guy like Tom Izzo maybe is going to win one more championship uh, a guy like John Beeline is in search for maybe one and then a series of Final Four runs. So I do think we got to take a step back and be realistic with what we're looking at here. Now, what I would be interesting to see is if John Beeline, if, I mean, I think they really are at a stepping stone. If they finish this season really well, if they get to another Final Four, maybe even get to another championship game. Uh, and I mean, God forbid. I mean, I would hate it. But let's say Michigan does win a national championship. What happens when John Beeline starts getting in on these big five-star recruits and he starts getting some some guys who might be coming to Michigan that might have gone to Duke otherwise? What's going to happen then? Is he going to have a similar downfall that Tom Izzo had? Or are these guys going to buy in? Because I think it's a – unless you're going to get all those guys like Duke and Kentucky can, I think it's – you have – you got to just go with what you're what you're getting right now. Man, if Michigan starts to get the Zion Williamson's and they start getting the national five star guys, holy cow, look out! I think for Michigan, uh, John Beeline needs a championship. I mean, getting to the finals twice is good, but I do think he needs to cement it. And man, Jason, this could be a team to do it if they can stick together. If they can add just one more weapon in the next year. I think that this team could be the team to beat in the future because they can shoot. They got three guys that want the ball. They got upper-class leadership. I like what I'm seeing. I think that the future looks good for Michigan. I just think this year could be another learning year, but I do think one of the two teams, Michigan State and Michigan, uh, maybe one or both could theoretically get to the Final Four. It's a a real possibility because Michigan can get better. That's the scary thing. (laughs) It's real scary. So you don't think sticking one of these one-and-done stars um, Michigan would affect the chemistry of the team at all? Uh, I, I think John Beeline's going to shy away from that. I think unless it's a slam dunk and the guy loves Michigan, I think they should shy away from it and just keep going. And ha- you have your system, go get guys that are going to compete, shoot the three, and you know have size and rebounding and defensive prowess. I don't think that, you know what, it's it's not advantageous because it basically changes your team year in, year out. Whereas you could see teams maybe with less talent but are together, that have senior leadership, if you can get a collection of three or four seniors, you can make a run in the tournament. So I think for Michigan, it would behoove them actually not to do that. Because look at what happened last year with Michigan State. You know, everyone's talking about, you know, last year and Tom Izzo and the big mistake that he he made with Jaron Jackson keeping him on the bench. Well, for Tom Izzo, he has a reason Obviously, I don't agree with it, and no no fan of Michigan State agreed with only playing Jaron Jackson about 16 minutes versus Syracuse, but there was a reason. The big reason was Jaron Jackson defensively was terrible. He wasn't in position. He would give up points, 
and he would make mistakes. He'd get into foul trouble. And Tom Izzo was a guy that said, look, I'm not going to put a guy out there that's not going to compete on both ends of the floor. I'm not going to put in a guy that is going to loaf. And, and that's a decision that he made. But now he's got to live with it in that now Jaron Jackson obviously grew over a summer and we're seeing a version of him in the NBA that's like, holy cow, and we're seeing growth with Miles Bridges. But those they're not the same players that they were last March. They grew. They evolved their skills. So Tom Izzo thought that he did right by these guys, and I think that if he probably thought about it now, he probably is like, you know what, these one and dones probably give us more headache than what they're really worth. Oh, yeah, totally, and... I mean, it's going to be interesting to see how the the rest of this season plays out. It's gonna, it should be an interesting March. Yeah, no doubt about it. The college teams give us a lot of hope. But now, did you take in the divisional playoff games in the NFL? Man, it was a great weekend. Now, it wasn't one filled with a bunch of offensive scoring, but there were competitive games that were really entertaining. That that was I was I'm on the latter side. That I felt like it was. Yeah, it was it was interesting, but it was just I don't know, it was kind of a dud just seeing all those low scores. I mean, I I want to see. Like, I mean, you we talked about it when we heard when we had the the Chiefs and the, and the Rams playing, and you have the them scoring the most points. That's what I want to see in the playoffs. I want to see the best players, and I think obviously in going to the the divisional rounds, we're going to see more because we we'll see those best teams. So I'm looking forward to this weekend. This past week, I mean, we saw some, I mean, some crazy football, but it was kind of a snooze fest for me. Oh man! Well, my excitement I'll share was this was the Chicago Philly game. I took in two games in full where I was fully attending and watching and attentive and paying attention. I took in the Dallas game versus Seattle, and I took in the Philly versus uh, Chicago game. Now, in the Dallas game, it was interesting in that you know you had. Schottenheimer, the offensive coordinator there in Seattle, kind of really relying on the run, and he forgot that he had Russell Wilson until the fourth quarter, and I think that there was missed opportunities there on offense for Seattle to do some things, and then Dallas, holy cow, man, they uh, took advantage of the their opportunities, and they played well, and uh, they're advancing, and they're a team that can play well versus the big dogs, and then you look at Philadelphia, Chicago, yeah, it was kind of a snooze fest, but you look at Nick Foles, and the dude just comes in when he's asked, and he just handles his business. And it was really impressive to see a guy like that continue his success. And, you know, obviously, if you paid attention today, the talk has been about seriously evaluating what is Nick Foles. On Sunday, you know, like you know I'm going to do on Twitter at Detroit Podcast, I put out a question, and I said, would you rather have Nick Foles be the guy under center here in Detroit as opposed to number nine. And we got a plethora of responses. Some people said, are you kidding me? You know, Nick Foles is a guy that's just a closer. He's not a guy that you're going to give $20 million to. Some people said, heck yeah, all he does is win. If you can get him at an affordable price, bring him here. And others were just like calling me crazy. But this guy, Nick Foles, is an enigma. It's real interesting because there are some people right now, Jason, that are championing the position that Nick Foles should be maybe the starter going into next year for the Eagles. Uh, it's just, it's such a tough position and it's a, you don't have a full body of work. I mean, you, I think you have to see a full season of the guy. I mean, who's to say that if, uh, if Carson Wentz was healthy, that they didn't just, they would have won last year still. And what's to say that they wouldn't have, still done what they did in the playoffs this year so far with Carson Wentz. I think it it's really tough to say, you know, and they've invested a lot in Carson Wentz. And Carson Wentz, I mean, you can't really say the guy's been awful. You know, in his rookie year, he or last year, he was having a great season until he got hurt. And, and this year, it's just unfortunate it goes down again. They were having a bit of a down year. I think it's you have to look more at the team because I know anybody who would say, Bring Nick Foles in over Matt Stafford. I'm not going to call you crazy, but what I would say is, you know, if you if it was an affordable price, I would be interested because I think having that affordable quarterback who can win games and maybe not maybe not may be the best quarterback in the league, 
people can at least get you there. Having that quarterback at a lesser price lets you get more on offense, get more on the defensive side of the ball. So I think the idea of that, of getting an affordable quarterback, that's what NFL teams and especially the Lions should be looking at right now. Okay, Jason, sit down. This might shock you, but there was a game that took place this weekend that kind of opened my eyes and changed my perspective a little bit on Matthew Stafford, okay? Because there was a team that a lot of fans said, look, look what they did. They brought in a young quarterback to push the old guy out. There was a young quarterback drafted. Let's go do that. And then you saw what Lamar Jackson went out and tried to do, and it was an epic disaster. And sometimes you look at what teams do and you say, man, you know what? I know that John Harbaugh wants to give confidence to Lamar Jackson, but I do think at halftime of that game, when he had less than 25 yards, I think, passing, I do think that he probably should have went to Joe Flacco. And I will give Stafford credit. He's got experience. He's got the wherewithal of knowing what to do. I don't think that if Stafford were to you know, be put to the bench, I just think it'd be a miracle to believe that a young quarterback can just come in and beat Tom Brady and just lift the uh, Detroit Lions out of obscurity and into relevance. So I know that Stafford probably is the best guy for the job, but I think the best case scenario is to make Stafford a game manager and build a supreme defense and make a run like Denver did where in the Super Bowl, uh, a guy like Peyton Manning had like 190 yards passing and looked like a shell of himself, but the defense was so awesome, led by Von Miller, that they were able to win. So I'll look at it like this perspective. I don't think the organization, the Lions, are going to push Stafford by really bringing in Connor Cook, but at the same time, man. Ooh, by the way, I like that. I, know, I think that was a great signing. We'll talk about it. But I think that Lamar Jackson kind of got his uh, his early education in the world of playoff football. And I don't think you can – In that, I was watching that game, and I, I do agree with the announcers. They're saying – it was it was Romo, Tony Romo. He said, I think you go with Lamar Jackson the first series. If he doesn't have it, I think you put Flacco out. And I think that was your window of opportunity. He still didn't have it at that point. I think you bring Flacco in at that point to maybe see if you can turn something around. By sticking with Lamar Jackson in that third quarter, it was just – Bringing in Joe Flacco at that point would have just been pointless. It would have been you're bringing in a, a super cold quarterback at that point. And I mean, what for for what you're you're down by 17, almost 20 points at that point, and you're just going to kill the kid's confidence. I think I think you probably helped your team a little bit more by keeping keeping him in there, running that two minute offense. And you saw that he does have the capability to make some 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 crazy plays because I saw there was I mean, he's he's has the ability to move around in the pocket. There was just there's some things that I saw him do that I've only seen on like Madden football games. So it, it'll be interesting to see if he can develop in his second and possibly in third years if he can become more of a passer because obviously if, if he's going to be a mobile quarterback and a run first quarterback. He's not going to be long for this NFL. Yeah, because of the fact that he ran for so many plays that it's going to be tough to avoid injury. And I do think he's got to become more of a passer and then use the running as a weapon where it's more designed because these, these young quarterbacks, what they do is they go through their progressions, read one, read two, read three, run. And it's like, no, no, no. Sometimes if you can stay in the pocket, fight for that extra second or two, somebody can come open. And so it's an interesting case. And yeah, before we talk about Stafford, who are your favorites to get to the Super Bowl from the AFC and the NFC? Who do you like right now? Uh, I mean, if you ask who I'm rooting for, I would definitely be rooting for the Saints. Just I think it would be a perfect story. Breeze wins another Super Bowl and goes out on top. I think that would be a great story. But it's definitely going to be a battle between the Saints and the Rams. You know, it'll be. Are the Rams struggles late in the season going to carry over into uh, into the playoffs? It'll be interesting to see this weekend how that plays out. And then on the AFC side, you always can't count out the Patriots, the the Kansas City Chiefs. I, I feel like the NFL should have figured out their offense by now. And I've been saying it for almost about two seasons now because I said the same thing about Tyreek Hill last year, that why can't people defend 
50, 60 yard touchdowns and they just continuously get beat by this guy. So uh, it's, I think when it's all said and done, I, I think it's probably going to be, uh, I think it's going to be Patriots and Saints. Patriots and Saints. Okay, we'll see how it shakes out. So you like the addition of Connor Cook, the future signing. You think he's an upgrade over Jake Rudock to be the backup? I think he's an upgrade over Jake Rudock. I think he he got a raw deal in that draft. I think he should have gone so, uh, someplace way better that had a better opportunity. By getting drafted by the Oakland Raiders, he had absolutely no shot of starting there or getting any chance because Derek Carr was – he was in the franchise quarterback mode. There wasn't going to be anybody really challenging him for that. So I do like, I wanted the Lions to take a flyer on him. They didn't. And I think this is going to be, it'll be interesting to see what happens. I mean, he may not even make the team by the beginning of the season, but I'm interested to see what he can do. Yeah, I think that, you know what, uh, when uh, the Lions and Raiders practiced and things like that, there there was an opportunity to see what Connor Cook could do, and maybe there's a belief that, uh, you know, a new offensive coordinator can do some things, but I don't think he's been brought in here to seriously push Matthew Stafford. It's more of an insurance policy because everybody heard what Bob Quinn said, and he believes in Matthew Stafford. Obviously, when you give a quarterback that much money in an extension, that's going to be the guy. So I do give Stafford one more year. Uh, Bob Quinn came out uh, late last week on Friday, and he gave about a 45-minute talk. Did anything stick with you in regards to anything that he said that bothered you? Look, I think Bob Quinn knows how to talk to the media. He knows how to give his answers and his intentions. But here's the thing in regards to Bob Quinn. I think he should just come out a couple more times so that a press conference isn't a rehash of everything that was brought up from September all the way into January. It was crazy to hear all the questions about his thoughts about the hiring practices of Patricia, all the in-season stories and stuff like that. And So I think a guy like that probably could put out some fires if he talked sooner. Now he gave the ringing endorsement to Stafford. He talked about his loyalty to you know, Matt Patricia and the fact that they got to do a better job of surrounding uh, Stafford with more talent. So he gave, you know, the endorsement of his quarterback, which I think he probably had to do. The part that basically bugged me was when he said, look, it's not all Stafford's fault. We got to do a better job and basically making excuses for Stafford. I, I could have went without that. I could have just had him say, look, everybody across the board that comes here to Allen Park and plays at Ford Field's got to do a better job and that this organization will take a step forward. I'm learning, and we're going to make this. A, a, I, uh, I'm going to work hard to make this an organization you guys can be proud of. I understand what this team needs, and we're going in the right direction. Stick with us. That's all I really needed him to say. Making excuses for Stafford was just a big turnoff. Yeah, and I agree, I agree with everything, everything you just said. Uh, the excuses are unnecessary. We've we've heard them all. That's, that's what we've lived, lived through. And what I want to understand, and maybe maybe it is the same in other sports cities, but I feel like Detroit, we just have an infatuation with our general manager. And maybe it's because we were burned for so long with the, this, the stench of Matt Millen that we're so worried about our GM being, you know, perfect and making all the right moves. And obviously winning helps if, you know, if we're winning, we're probably not hearing from Bob Quinn. We really are. I mean, I should be hearing all this. I want to hear all this stuff from Matt Patricia. I don't want to hear diatribes and him giving dumb lectures about meaningless stuff. I want to hear him saying that, hey, you know, we just collectively need need to be better. And I want Bob Quinn to just produce. So that's what I took away from it is that, just go out there and figure out what's wrong. And if St- they really have tied themselves to Stafford, that and I get if they if they are planning ahead that you know after next year it's a so it's, it's a lesser cap hit moving on from Stafford. But if they really are sticking with Stafford and this is what we're gonna do, then he really really. He needs to sit down with Patricia. He needs to sit down with everybody. They need to evaluate everything, and they need to figure this out and how to 
what's the game plan? What's what's our how long is it going to take to really get to where we need to be to be competing? Yeah, I think that uh, 2019 is going to be a real interesting season, Jason. I think from the draft to the OTAs to preseason, a lot of people are ready to say, you know what, Bob Quinn, if you can't get this team into the playoffs with some wins in four years and you have a coach that could be a dud and has a lot more negativity than positivity, I think there could be a serious chance if it does go south real fast that it could be Bob Quinn. Matt, Patricia, and Stafford all getting broomed out in 2019 in one foul swoop and say, look, because the fans are angry. They're not happy. They're not into this rebuild nonsense. They're like, look, every conversation revolves around the fact that it's been a 60-year drought. They haven't won a division in forever. The A lot of the talk is negative. You're going to have a lot of booing. And, and Jason, when you look at that schedule, I, I said to myself, I thought that, that when you suck – that you get a real easy schedule, and it's only a game or two that flexes out to that position. Did you see the tweet I had with that schedule? It's brutal, bro. And some of the teams that come to Fort Field next year are going to be awesome, and there's going to be a chance to really see how the Lions shake out. Yeah, and uh, I mean, obviously we have the whole offseason and draft and free agency to go through, but there's nothing that is that they've proved to me that they're going to be anything better than eight and eight yeah, going yeah, forward. Yeah. So I think that's, that's what we're looking at right now. Unless we see marked improvement across the board, eight and eight is the best we're looking at the best we can hope for. I mean, that's you have your six games against your division who I think you can play well against. And then you're going to have a couple, you know, easy games against the, the bad teams in the, whichever NFC and AFC divisions we're playing this year. Jason, but it's here, just... here it is. Here it is. Home, Dallas, New York Giants, Kansas City Chiefs, Los Angeles Chargers, the Bears, Vikings, Packers, and Tampa Bay Bucks. Bro, that's serious competition. Yeah, I mean, you. it was a lot of games you just threw at me. I know the first four, I basically just thought all off. <laughs> yeah, right? And then you throw in our division, and... I think, I think you're your best if you can split that. So now you're looking at three and seven. And what are the other six games? Here, here's the away portion. The Redskins, the Eagles, Denver, Oakland, Green Bay, Minnesota, Chicago, and Arizona. Right now, the only two games maybe you can officially call wins are the Tampa Bay Bucks the Arizona Cardinals, and maybe a game with the Green Bay Packers. The rest are going to be a grind. I think the Redskins. I think you can yeah. chuck that as a W. Yeah, man. But I'm just listening to all that. It's just like, how can how are they going to be better than anything better? Like, I say 8-8, eight and eight, and I feel like that's being very generous. Ooh. Because more than likely, uh, you're looking at 7-9 and nine and 6-10 and ten again. Yeah. Well, before we end this podcast, I've enjoyed the conversation with Jason. I want to wish everybody a happy new year. The Motor City Sports Rant is back. We'll be here most Tuesdays. I think Jason will be in studio next week. We'll try to coordinate a lot more times in the office. But anytime Jason's on the phone, it always makes for a great conversation. But you and I can sit back and collectively laugh at what's going on with the Michigan Wolverines because two of their coaches potentially could be going to Ohio State. One for sure signed on. Uh, former defensive line coach Greg Madison is now going over to Ohio State to be the defensive coordinator, and there's another coach that's being recruited, and Michigan fans are like, what? Seriously? A guy that was maize and blue is now going in the next year to coach for Ohio State? And I just told everybody, man, in my two-minute address, this new daily podcast that I'm doing, I'm like, you know what? So what? You know what? In this day and age, if you're a fan that thinks about loyalty with these guys, Come on, man. If I flash you some some green, uh, I could take you from your job and you could be my assistant if I if I paid you enough. And it's just a situation where you got to relax on this whole loyalty thing. It's good to talk about as a fan, but Greg Madison's getting a fat raise and he's getting a promotion. Who the hell is going to turn that down? Yeah, absolutely. I love it. Love it, See right? See you later, Mish. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's a great scenario in which you say, Greg Madison, so long, sucker. And uh, it's a scenario in which I can't, I, I literally can't wait to see Ryan Day versus Jim Harbaugh round one 
And if Day wins that first contest and the defense plays a lot better and, and shuts down Michigan, oh, man. But I do think, though, those that, like myself and you, are, could also take the angle that, you know what, Harbaugh's been there four years, and you know what, his position – could be, you know, starting to reveal itself as a guy that's annoying, that people don't want to be around, that guys like Gentry, the tight end, might want to go pro early, that coaches just might want to leave, and it might be a scenario in which, if people digged, there might be some things going on over there at Michigan that are not too flattering in regards to Harbaugh. It can't be all roses, right? No, there's 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 got to be something, and I know they're going to – on the face, they're going to say everything's great. We love Jim Harbaugh. He's still Jesus in khakis. But you know that they're sweating underneath. And every maize and blue sandwich they eat, they're choking down. <laughs> Jason, before I let you go, do you think D'Antonio's going to make any moves to that offensive staff? It hasn't happened yet. And the more days that pass, the more I'm starting to get worried that Jesus, I don't think he's going to change that offensive staff. I just think he's going to roll with it and keep being loyal to his guys. What the hell's going on? Yep. That's absolutely what's going to happen. It's going to be so extremely frustrating. I mean, oh. we're, I, you're, we're going to get healthy next year. And, you know, obviously the, the season, there's going to be more injuries. So we'll just be seeing what's going to happen. Is it going to be Lurky? Is it going to be, you know, Rocky? What's, what's going to, what's going to shake out. And I just, I'm so disappointed with what Michigan State has done. I I need to I need some sign. Yes, I need they need yes. to give me something. Yes, you can follow Jason on Twitter at Jarvi the King. You can follow the network at Detroit Podcast. One final thought from Jason: How did you finish in fantasy football? Did you win anything? Did you get ranked anywhere? What was your highest finish? Uh, highest finish. I think my highest finish was sixth. Oh. So I, I, had, I had a rough season. I had some injuries. Uh, I did make up for it in my main league. I ended up. I drafted Saquon Barkley in the first round. I was able to trade him to a guy who he got to the championship game but lost. But I traded him Saquon Barkley for another first round pick next year. So next year I have two first round picks and two third round picks in our snake draft, which I am super pumped about. Just like Detroit sports, just like the Wolverines, just like the Michigan State Spartan football team, always next season. That's Jason's fantasy life. All right, Jason, always Absolutely. always next season. You've just downloaded the latest edition of the Motor City Sports Rant. See everybody next time. Thanks, Jason. Peace. Nice idiot. Uh huh. F- you. Bye bye. Take care now. Bye-bye then. User.